Um, this right here is uh, Gary Garcia. And uh, when I came to uh, the church that I've pastored now, next month, 21 years, um, it was right around now, 21 years ago, that you and I went out to a restaurant together because I showed up at this church where they were interested in maybe hiring me. And um, they said, we only have one requirement of whoever comes to the church, and that is you've got to give this guy Gary a shot. Uh, Gary had grown up in the church. There is a video of his mother walking in the front door of our church pregnant with him. So he went around a while. And he had just kind of fallen into, after a church split with a youth pastor had left, he was just one of the youth leaders, and it kind of fell into him uh, overseeing it about a year, a year and a half before I came. That, ha that happened a little over a year. And so they said, you got to give him a shot. And I thought, you know, the average youth pastor lasts like seven months. So how bad could it be? 21 years later, we're still working together at the same church. So um, I just want to introduce you to uh, the best partner in ministry I have ever had or ever will have. Uh, this is my friend and my youth pastor, Gary Garcia. And, yes, you uh, and we, are, we want to talk to you about staff relationships. We want to talk to you about ministerial relationships. We want to talk to you about something he does extraordinarily well, which is working with volunteers, building a volunteer team, a volunteer network. Uh, and, all, and, and about all of that, we're just going to do it conversationally, questions back and forth, and then uh, by the end of it, before we break for lunch, to ask questions, uh, take some questions from you as well. I, I want to start by asking you this question. How have we gotten along for 21 years? Because I don't know two people in ministry who have di more different ministry styles, more different personality styles, more different emotional mixes than you and me. How has this worked? I think that's just it, though, is because uh, really where areas where I, I'm weak, you're so strong, and, and vice versa. Um, areas where I'm strong, maybe you're not as good at, you know, it's a little weird to say about your senior pastor, but... Um, but oh, no, I got a story about that. I'm gonna you down. <laughs> but I think it really helps, you know, that we really do, we, we play off each other very well, and it really works, and it really balances out in the church with the people, with ministry, with the way we do things. Um, it's uh, it's really helped us, but I would say probably the biggest key that I, I've been able to, to be where I'm at is one. Obviously, I feel called to be where I'm at, and it's it's kind of a, a rarity for you pastor to be at one place um, so long. But um, but part of it is just the being able to be with a senior pastor who uh, very much you, you connect with, and, and we um, he, I've never described uh, Pastor Carl as a, as a micromanager. He has given uh, our staff through the years so much freedom. To, to dream and, and try things and fail and all of those things to where, you know, I'll get together with other youth pastors and, and at some point one or two of them will just kind of share frustrations about this or this isn't working or they don't let me do that. And I just do not relate um, to that because I've, I've been in a place where I've been allowed to grow and experience and, you know, he has his vision and his dreams and, and, and um, we get to be a part of that. But he also lets us have visions and dreams, um, not just for our ministry, so not just for the youth ministry, but for the church itself. I, I get to actually plan things for the church, um, and, and uh, you know, and again, just things that God puts on my heart. Um, I, I, I have the uh, the freedom to, to do those things. So probably the biggest reason that we've been able to do this so long is just um, I've had a, a boss who who lets me, you know, have the freedom to, to dream and to, to make those things happen. So. One of the, the kind of guiding principles that I use is a simple phrase, and you can write this down, that I've used working with Gary, because he's been the one staff member I've had for 21 years, is hire people you trust, then trust the people you hire. The moment you can't trust them, I'm not going to keep them around anymore. I'm not going to work with people I don't trust. Just bottom line, it's very simple. But if you trust them, trust them. But trust but verify. And no, don't don't say that means I'm, I'm never going to follow up. But you know, I I, I took them on because I was asked, hey, you got to give them a shot. I mean, how how many times did we sit down and have lunch and sit down and go out to coffee or whatever in the first first three or four years while both of us were trying to figure out how to do this thing? And we were both so naive and so green and so inexperienced and quite frankly so stupid. For the first three or four years we worked together, neither one of us had a clue. So we just sat down together and kept talking it out. We just kept working at it. 
And I think to, to kind of answer my own question that I started with, I think the main reason that we've been able to last this long together is that word trust. Uh, I trust him. He trusts me. Um, it used to be, you know, he'd have to run things by me, and I'd go, I don't know, I don't know. And like I said, we're so different on things. He has, he has, for instance, a visual eye. He has a, he, he, the, the look of the church right now is predominantly because of what he's done, both the long-term stuff as well as the most recent kind of renovations that we've done. Years ago, when he had an idea for how to change the bulletin, how to change the look of the stage or whatever, he'd run it by me. I could never see it in my head. I'd go, well, what about this? I don't get this, I don't get this. And I remember one time, I think we were working on a logo. And he had this idea. And I didn't like the idea at all. I wanted multiple multiple color, and I think he just wanted two color or something. And we were actually sitting, he was standing at my desk next to me. And I had been working on my message. So here's all my sermon notes right here. And here is his idea for the logo. And I'm questioning it, and I don't get it, and it's not good, and I want you to change it, I want to, and he looks at me. I think we've been working together about seven, eight, nine years at the time. And he puts his hand on my notes, and he goes, Pastor, you do this better than anybody I know. And he put his hand over on the logo, but I do this better than you. Don't tell me how to do this, and I won't tell you how to do that. Now, I don't know if the words were that direct, but that was how it struck me. And I, I looked at it and I went, he's right. I, I can't see that stuff in advance. I don't have a clue. Now, if you're brand new, if you're online and you've been seven months as a youth pastor, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> but, if you've been, but if after a few years you can't do that with each other, I think you've got to, there's something going on here. And as pastors, you need to give your staff members the freedom to talk to you that way. They need to be able to be that honest with you. Because if they feel like they've got to walk around on eggshells, they've got to use the appropriate terminology, they can't say anything that might possibly be offensive, you won't get the best stuff out of them. Because the best stuff usually comes when it just, afterwards you go, oh, I can't believe I said that. That's usually where the best stuff comes. It just kind of erupts out of us. And so we've been able to build that trust. And I think that the, probably if we're going to put one word that makes this work, trust is probably the word that makes it work more than anything else, right? Yeah, I would say for sure trust is, is really what it's built on. And, and just the idea of, um, you know, I, I mean, there's still the respect factor. He's still my boss. He's still my pastor. Um, and, you know, so, uh, but again, there's just that freedom to, to, to know that I do have an opinion. I do get to, you know, this is not just the place I work. It's my church. And I want to be passionate about it. I want to be excited about it. I want to be a part of the, the vision and the dream. And, you know, it can't be just one guy on top doing all that. And, and just expect everyone to follow along. You know, the fact that I got to have a dream and a vision and, and buy into his, but also share mine, um, it, it's just kept this working for so long and, and it will continue to work because I, I have that opportunity. And, and I, you know, I, I know guys that feel like, well, I never speak on Sundays. I never really get to talk about, you know, the sermons or ideas or anything else like that. And, and I do, I get to put input in, I get to share my heart. And he doesn't always do everything that, that I say, but at least I get to put it out there and, and say, here's my thought on it. And it's great to have a senior pastor that will call you in and say, hey, I was thinking about this. What do you think about it? You know, I'm thinking about doing this series for Christmas. What do you think about it? Um, that's, that's such an honor to be able to, to have that kind of opinion and feel like I'm, I'm not just working for him. I'm part of this. You know, I'm a part of this whole church, and, and that's a, a big, big deal for a youth pastor. I, I see, again, to the lead pastors, I think one of my biggest jobs as a lead pastor is to figure out how to say yes to my staff. Because we talked about it earlier. I bring experience. I've got 35-something years under my belt now. But I realize that experience can also be an anchor at times if I don't take it well. Now, he's got plenty of experience now, too, 21 years at it. But now he's also got youth leaders. Some of them are here with us now. And they are really fresh in this. And they see things with fresh eyes that neither one of us sees. And so if I can listen to those fresh eyes and that fresh approach, and if I can hear it, then I can add my experience to that. So my, one of my primary jobs is to figure out how to say yes to those who work with me, to my paid staff, to my volunteer staff. And by figuring out how to say yes, I don't mean that I just green light every crazy idea. Sometimes the idea comes to me and I go, 
there's, there's good three quarters of that I can't say yes to, but let's figure out how to adapt it so that it becomes a yes. I think too many of us new pastors, we think that our foot is on the brake all the time. We feel like that's our call from God, is to hit the brakes on all of these young whippersnappers and all their crazy ideas. I don't think so. I think my hands should be on the steering wheel. They're, they're hitting the accelerator like crazy. Occasionally I gotta tap that brake, but most of the time I just wanna steer their speed into a good, healthy direction, and my experience can bring that in. But why would I wanna hit the brake on passion? Right? Even if the passion is slightly misguided, that's why I'm at the steering wheel. Let's help guide it. Let's help figure out how to say yes to that. Now, I know you've also been able to take that, and you now adapt that idea of training up others and having them make mistakes and trusting them and turning them loose with some of your youth leaders. Um, and one of the things we talked about before we did this was we wanted to talk about how this relationship, and most people won't have that. You know, here's, here's my... If I were to put it very simply, if you want to have a wonderful, healthy, successful small church, find a guy like Gary Garcia and keep him for 21 years. If you can't do that, <laughs> which is where 99.9% of the rest of us do, then what do we do? And the way we do it is we bring people along still with the same idea, even if they can't stay forever. Hire people you trust, trust the people you hire, try to figure out how to say yes to their crazy ideas. And then we have been able to duplicate this relationship and these ideas into the hearts of the other people that we work with. So you now have a, uh, a youth training team. Tell, tell them about some of the different ways we're training up youth, from worship workshops to internship to whatever. Well, before I do that too, I wanted to say that you know one of the, the things we talked about trust, and we talked about all of that stuff, and, and definitely um, you know when you when you, if you spend any amount of time with us, we are very different. Um, you know, he's angels, I'm Dodgers. Uh, it goes on from there, you know. It, but just the way relationally we would deal with people, the, um, I would say he's a, a, pre, a, a teacher, where I'm more of a preacher style when it comes to speaking. Um, you know, there's just so many differences. I'm more head, he's more heart. <laughs> but we always, but even, you know, I can probably count on time uh, on my hand the time that we've hung out, like going out to dinner together, right? You know, our, our, you know, it's just not a lot of that stuff happening. But the, the center of our relationship is Christ, obviously, the church, and this, this trust that we have. And to, to have someone around you, that's probably the key, is finding those people who you just have so much trust with that, that they really are. But you want to make sure, and here's the biggest thing, is he's made me want to be his armor bearer. Does that make sense? I want to protect him. I want to guard him. I want to make sure that, that he's covered. And I, I tell youth pastors and, and just other staff members whenever I'm talking to them all the time, that if you want to, to be successful in your relationship with your lead pastor, be their armor bearer. But on the other side of that, for lead pastors, be the kind of lead pastor they want to guard. They want to protect. They want to take care of. You know, I do everything I can to, to be that for him. And, and just the simple things of the idea of, um, you know, if I hear someone, if someone comes to me in the church and says, well, I'm frustrated about this, or I'm frustrated about that, and, you know, they, they feel com more comfortable coming to a younger pastor than the lead pastor, and but if I hear stuff like that, I instantly go to him. And not because I'm a tattletale, because I don't want my lead pastor fighting battles that he doesn't know he's fighting. And, you know, and, and again, why is that? Because I want to be his armor. I want to protect him, because he's made me want to. And I think that's a big key for, for lead pastors is, you know, becoming and having that relationship with your staff where they want to guard you. They want to protect you. They want to look out for you because they have buy-in. They're all into what you're doing and, and believe in you as their lead pastor. So I'd say that's a huge part of, of the trust and, and what we do. Um, as far as, as working with leaders, we have a great leadership team in the youth ministry um, department. We have about 21 volunteers, and then we have um, two interns that work with us, and then two guys um, that want to go into youth ministry that are working with us, too. And, and uh, you know, a lot of that has just been recruiting and grabbing hold of those um, guys and girls. And what's great is um, having all of them, it's really freed me up to do other things within the church. And pastor was gone um, in uh, Europe speaking at a, at a pastor's conference over there for three weeks. And for that three weeks, I had a team that could cover a lot of my stuff so I could oversee, you know, Sunday mornings and, and some of the other things happening. But um, we have some great things. We, for our worship workshop he was talking about, we really believe in pouring into the next generation of, of young people and bringing them up. So on youth night, which is Tuesday night for us, um, from 5 to, to 6, 
um, before our, our worship practice, our youth worship practice, five to six, students who want to be involved in, in learning worship, they can know nothing. If they want to learn how to play guitar or want to play drums or they already do, they can come to worship workshop and begin to learn that, begin to be a part of that, begin to be trained in that. Um, singing, working the soundboard, all of those things is what Worship Workshop is all about. Raising up young people um, to, to, to be a part of worship and getting the heart for worship and all the different elements of it. My son who's 19 uh, now, he's over in Australia at Hillsong um, at their school of ministry. Um, he started in Worship Workshop. You know, as a, as a 12 year old, he's barely had to play guitar. The guitar was bigger than him, but went through the ranks and by the time he hit um, 17, um, through different circumstances, he was our, our worship leader at the church, leading on Sunday mornings and, and uh, doing a great job. But uh, again, it's because we, we really do buy into the generation behind us and always training someone to take over, always having someone behind us to do that job. And not necessarily that they're going to do that and, and take our job or we're going to quit, but you always want to be pouring into a group of people behind you. Tyler, who's back there, he's going to be taking the photos today. Tyler um, is a Vanguard student, but I've known Tyler for a long time, and, and uh, he grew up in this area, and uh, he wants to be a youth pastor. And so Tyler is at our church learning youth ministry, hanging out. Um, he spoke two weeks ago on a, on a, on a Tuesday night. Um, I, I try to hand those things off. Again, I'm trying to pour everything I can into him, so there's always something. I could go out of town tomorrow, and I, knew, I know Tyler can run our entire youth ministry for as long as I need him to. Because we've poured into the people behind us, and that's so key um, with leaders and volunteers especially, is grabbing hold of them, giving them buy-in by making them a bigger part of it. And this is a big advantage of small churches. Uh, don't get discouraged you think, oh, I can do that. 21 youth leaders, we don't have 21 kids in our town. Yeah. Uh, we, we're, this, is, this is at the 21-year point for us. Ten years ago, our testimony was very different. Okay, we're talking, it took us 21 years to get here. And it took us 21 years of falling down 100 times and getting up 101 times. Okay, it just, it just is that, it takes that amount of time. But the, what, what I want to talk about, I, I lost my train of thought there for a moment. It was awesome, too. Um, training them up. Yeah, what, what we have found is, uh, another, uh, small churches do this, that's where it was. Here's, here's the advantage of the small church. Uh, an intern who goes to a big church, uh, will find themselves slivered. They'll be the intern for the worship department, they'll be the intern for, for the youth department, or for the kids department, or for the tech department, or whatever. In a small church, by the time they leave at the end of their year, they will have touched every single aspect of church ministry. Because you can't avoid it in our church. Everything interacts with everything. So they might have some of an emphasis in a particular area, but they're not going to leave and not have worked with kids or not have worked with seniors or not have helped setting up and tearing down constantly. I mean, it's our room that looks like this and is about the size gets set up or torn down 8, 10, 11 times a week because we have the one room. That's it. Uh, and they buy into that and they're a part of that process. And the reason they buy in is because they get a chance to try hands-on. It's another advantage of small church is they get to do hands-on at a small church, whereas, who was it who was talking about earlier, you know, you're a third tier, fourth tier drummer at a mega church, and you, you might be a studio musician, but you're only gonna get up there once every seven weeks. But if you're in a smaller church, we'll throw you on stage, and you'll learn on stage. We had our worship workshop kids, and one of the best Sundays I've ever had at our church was what, maybe eight, nine weeks ago, and it was the first time ever that all the kids in the worship workshop had worked long enough that they had four songs. And so the entire team on stage that Sunday was our kids, 12 years old, 13 years old, whatever they were. That just and, and, and everybody in the room is sitting there between grins and tears. Because that's my kid up there. That, that's the kid I taught in Sunday school. That's the kid I learned how to, I showed him how to play that C chord. And, 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 and you just sit there and they were, and they were good too, which was really nice. You know, because <laughs> they start and you're nervous, you're going, oh, I hope it's not really awful. We'll love it either way, but I hope it's not really awful, but they're actually really, really good. And small churches do that really well. So don't wait until you've had a lot of years under your belt or you've got a certain number of people in the church. We started doing, how many false starts did we have for worship workshop? 
we tried it and then it failed, and we tried it and then it failed, right, several times. Yeah, I, I, probably about two or three times, and, and uh, but it all depends a lot too on our volunteers. There's and, and you'll know this, you guys know this, but anyway, there's time when you have there's seasons when you have volunteers to pull that ministry off, and there's time when you don't. And the one thing I figured out, and, and I would say for us, you know, we figured out is we can't do it all. And you know, and just kind of a side note, but if, you know, there was a, a time when when we were just the, the numbers weren't there. And we're like, well, I. And I, I would say, well, I'll handle men's ministries right now. I can do that. And, and now I won't say that anymore, you know. If there's not someone, a volunteer to come in to lead men's ministries, then men's ministries won't happen. Because I can't do everything. He can't do everything. And, and we'll, we'll kill ourselves if we try to. And so there's seasons. And I would say with worship workshop, there's times when we had um, the, the youth leadership to, 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 I don't play anything. I don't sing. I don't do any of that. And so if there wasn't someone there to, that could teach guitar, then that wouldn't happen. You know, so there's there's seasons when it worked and there's seasons when it doesn't. Right now we're in a great season when we have lots of um, instrumentalists that can come in and work with the students and teach them and pour into them. So that's a, I think it's a good season for us right now. Yeah, but but the, the the reason the season works now is because we decided years ago, as I said earlier, we here are two targets we keep hitting. We keep hitting, and one of the targets is people get trained here and get sent out, and some of it has to do with the relationship that we have. We just kept hitting this target. Another where we're, we're different. Like I said, I'm the teacher. He's the, more the preacher. I'm the head. He's the heart. Um, I tend to go treat everybody the same, but go shallow. He tends to find a handful of people and go deep. So his training tends to be relational, mentoring, hands-on. When he's tired, he still invites people over to his house. God deliver me from that. <laughs> when I'm tired, leave me alone. But I'll always be available equally for everybody. Uh, but it, there's a certain amount of, you know, and, and I'll be there for you. It's not that I'm avoiding depth or whatever, but for me as the pastor, i got to treat everybody exactly the same. He doesn't have to treat everybody the same because he's got a, a sliver of ministry, and he can go really deep in those areas, and the balance between that, between him living with others and me getting up then and teaching them so they can take something home, and then just before staff meeting, he's sitting in his office with five of these young leaders, and talking with them and living with them and going out to have coffee with them. And sometimes what comes up is, hey, Pastor Carl said this on Sunday. What does that mean and how do you live that out? And the balance between those two. And I'm not saying go out and find a scholar and find somebody who's going to be a mentor. Look at what you do have. Look at the balance of people God has given you. And quit complaining that they're different. Thank God that they are and utilize their differences. And again, as long as you can trust each other, that's where the key is. I want to do a, a quick Q&A before we have a quick break for lunch here in a moment, but did you have anything else you wanted to throw in that we hadn't touched on yet? Yeah, just one more thing I, I think um, I would say is, you know, one of the things that I try to teach um, in youth ministry whenever I'm talking to young youth pastors and we talk about students and students leaving and students don't want to be, uh, you know, how do we get students to this and to that and part of the church and, and, and one of the keys for this and, and it kind of leads into what I want to say is uh, our heart and, and kind of Someone asked me, you know, what's my what's my um, plan in youth ministry? What's my ultimate thing that I'm trying to do? And, and it's very easy. My goal in youth ministry is to get a student to a place where they stop referring to um, our place as their youth group and start referring to it as their church. Because once I can get them to stop calling it their youth group and start calling this building their church, then they're going to stick with us after high school and, and be a part of things. But the key to that too is, and, and one of the key, you know, we, we really do work hard on getting our high school students into Sunday morning service and, uh, and a part of it. And right now, if you came in, the first two rows are, are all teenagers. And, and, um, and uh, but the big thing with that, and I would say to you guys as lead pastors, is I, I'm blessed enough to have a lead pastor who realizes on Sunday mornings he's not just preaching to adults, he's not just a lead pastor to everybody 18 and over. He's lead pastor to the youth. He's lead pastor to the kids. And so when we have junior high and, and high school students in the audience, um, you know, he doesn't dumb it down necessarily, but he makes it, he, he remembers who he's preaching to. It's not just adults. And so our students are there. They are involved. They are listening um, because he remembers that. And that's a key. And, you know, if you have a, a church where you're saying our students don't stick around and uh, a youth pastor who doesn't work hard enough getting them there on Sundays, um, you know, it starts from, from you guys as lead pastors. We need you to remember you lead pastor everybody, not just the adults. And, and you need to lead pastor those students too, especially on Sunday mornings. Yeah. 
Great point. And, and, it, and it's not by trying to remember the latest, coolest thing. That's the worst thing you can do. Seriously, because they'll, they'll, they'll catch that in a moment. But, but be genuine. Let them know you love them. Be who you are and be genuine. Uh, I think genuineness goes way farther with younger people than trying to act cool ever can. So, you know, the last thing I do, anytime I try to act cool, every once in a while I've thrown out something and gone, no, I really can't do that one, can I? And the whole place has already gotten there before me. Like, yeah, you tried, but you couldn't. Yeah, so it's just not your, your age range. But I'm genuine. I love them, and they know that. And that's the biggest part of it. And questions before we uh, take a break for lunch. Anybody have anything about staff relationships, about working together, about training up uh, younger people, any of that? OK, once again, we've done so well. We've covered it exhaustively. Yes, sir. Um, how closely um, do you integrate um, a, a teaching strategy? Um, do you, Gary, do you process a lot with Carl on topics that you're covering? Do you guys try to track together? Um, do you, I mean, you've been doing this for 20 years, so uh, um, how does a veteran work together with the senior pastor and make sure that um, those, um, not just the values, I mean, you guys exemplify it well, not just your values, but um, uh, the, the strategy while working out together. For those online, because they wouldn't hear you, the question is how do we together implement a teaching strategy and coordinate teaching strategies? Is that the yes, is the question? Okay. I mean, it's one of the things where we don't do it very often. Um, January, we're actually doing a series where us and, and uh, the youth and the adults and the, and the kids' ministries are all kind of doing the same theme. But it goes back, I think, to our styles, too, uh, where he would like, um, he's been teaching on Romans for how long? A year? Yeah, for almost a year. Where two Sundays away from being done. But again, he's, he's a teacher. He loves to teach. He loves to really explain the scripture and applying it and going through it. Um, where I'm a, a very topical with students, so we change our series every month. We have a new series. And, um, you know, because my, my, my goal with youth ministry is I want to make sure I'm giving them something that they can use in their life, in their walk with Christ, right then, right there, that night. And we have other nights where we go a little deeper with small groups and, and different things, too. But I would say, overall, we don't very often. Yeah. Then where, in, where are other opportunities for you to integrate students into the adult population so that they say, this is my, this is my church? The okay. um, question is, if we don't do that, how, what, what do we use to integrate the students into the main life of the church? We do different ministries, so we have what's called Share Day, which we do um, you know, once a quarter, once every other quarter, where the whole church is together, and we go out and do ministry different places. And so that's one way where they integrate with each other. Um, other ways are um, missions. We always um, open our mission trips that we do for youth open to adults, and some adults will go with us. There's that connection made there. Uh, one of the funnest things we ever did was one night we invited, uh, I told all of our, our youth we have a, some special guests coming out tonight. And so, uh, and so they didn't, I didn't say who or, or what or, or you know anything. Um, I just said they're going to be joining us in a little bit. And so that night we invited um, about 15 to 16 of our of our seniors um, group to come and be a part of us that night. And so um, uh, we started worship and started worship and and uh, and then I said, well, our guests are here. And so I said, you guys can slide to the sides because our kids all come front up uh, front for worship. And so they slid to the sides. And the seniors came in. I did not plan this, was not expecting this. All of our students started clapping and cheering as our seniors came in and joined us that night. And what we did is we did a couple of their songs, we did a couple of our songs. And um, the reason doing that is I, at one point I told the students, I said, I want you to look around right now and, and look at, look at our, our adults that are here and, and watch them worship. Watch them sing. Maybe they, they like different songs than you do, but watch how passionate about, they are about those songs. And, and the whole idea was to help our students see that this is, what they're in right now, this is just the beginning. There's a long road ahead, and you can be just as passionate about Christ, you know, at, at 70 that you are at 17. And it was such an awesome night that we that really kind of saw just an intergenerational thing begin to happen and uh, take place. But we look for opportunities to do events that are generational, that both people can be involved in. We did a worship night um, two weeks ago called The Gathering where it was just a night of worship. Um, 
and led by our worship team, that the whole church was invited and you know, to, to stand up and look out in the audience and see, you know, uh, our, our you know seniors and our, our middle agers and our youth and our junior high and even some of our kids all there worshiping together. And you know, it was just a, a great time. So we, we try to plan events that, that do integrate everybody, that there is crossover um, through the generations and there's connection taking place and um, we encourage our young people to get involved in different ministries so we have you know high school and junior high students that are involved with kids ministries and they're working with adult leaders in kids ministries um, we have we just started a new ministry um, you know instead of greeters it's called first impressions team and so you know the people that are working the doors that are working the coffee um, station that are working the inside of the uh, the main sanctuary and greeting people when they're already seated. Um, you know, we literally we had about um, 20 junior high and high school students sign up and about 20 adults sign up, and they're all working together. Sunday, I can't wait till Sunday. Sunday, we're having a lunch after church together to start doing some planning. So it's all of them together. And so again, just finding any possibility to get our students around other adults and making sure our adults understand. You know, because the majority of our youth um, don't have family within the church. They're just teenagers from the area. And so I, I remind our, our uh, adults all the time, you know, the Bible says train a child in the way they should go. It doesn't say train your child. It says train a child. And so any child that crosses our doors, that comes into our church, they become ours. And, and it's our responsibility to train them up. And we can't do that if you don't know them. You can't do that. I refuse to let a generation, uh, lose a whole generation of students because adults are intimidated by them. You know, and I remind the adults all the time, you're adults. Go talk to them. Be the first. You know, don't wait for them to come to you, because you'll be waiting a long time. So, yeah, any any way we can to, to cross them over in any event we can, we, we try to. I think sometimes I, there's nothing wrong with it. Like you, the Gary said, in January we're already working on an entire series that the adults, the youth, and the kids will all be on the same subject matter together. But that's really, really rare for us. But I never worry that what he's doing or the tone at which he's doing it or the approach he's taking to something is ever going to contradict me or me contradict him. And, and, and that, that, that comes out of relationship. Relationship and longevity. And I think sometimes common curriculum is like a scaffolding that we have in place until we can develop the relationship and then we can pull the scaffolding away and have it rest on the relationship and on the trust. So if you need to have common curriculum in order to get to that place, in order to start talking in common ways, by all means, use it, but that shouldn't be the goal. The idea that everybody's learning exact, out of exactly the same book at the same time, I don't think is, is as necessary as that anywhere they go, even if the subjects are wildly different, the heart, the passion, the vision are always going to match up. There will never be a single contradiction. And there's no way to get there except for relationship over time. There's no substitute for those two things. And Again, we are talking right now, we are in a season right now where everything is banging. I mean, we can do no wrong, and we know it won't last. <laughs> but right now, everything's just great as can be, and we've been through some tough times, and it's been up and down and up and down. And I'm not talking numbers, although that's happened too. I'm talking about the mood and the health of the church. It has not been this upward trajectory of health. There were times seven or eight years in where we thought, this is never going to work because this thing just fell to pieces again. There were times four years ago before I wrote the book and all the stuff that came in where I was going through this emotional and spiritual crisis and I didn't know if my problems would sink the church. And God bless them, they held me up rather than me pulling them down. And this guy was one of the main reasons for it because he pulled them together when I was gone and said, we're not going to let him go, we're not going to let each other go. We're going to make it through this thing. And it's, it's relationships over time. Uh, do whatever you can to develop that. That's the heart, that's the meat of any healthy church, and a small church especially. Uh, that's, that's the juice that makes it go. Anything else real quick, because we are running a little late for lunch, and I know how awesome the food is. If not, thank you. Jeff, come on up, and he's going to tell us what we need to do.